Welcome back to Tech Ops. I'm Greg. I'm here with Eric. I'm Eric. And today we have uh, Ryan Macbeth. First time doing a guest on our video podcast. Yeah, we're trying, uh, we're trying to go back to the old school way of doing it that I feel was uh, very successful, like bringing on interview guests and talent and stuff. And um, they always bring on a, a, an extra view that we don't necessarily have. So I think it's really important to bring on a lot of these guests to do interviews. And uh, Ryan is somebody that connected with us because he made his own sh YouTube short about one of the shows that you did. Oh, yeah. Will Russia's nuclear weapons actually work? Covert Cabal brought up an interesting point in their latest video, which you can find in the description below. And it all goes back to Tritium. And uh, I noticed it and it got a whole crap ton of views. And so uh, I invited him on and now he's here. So I'd like to invite uh, Ryan or I'd like to introduce Ryan Macbeth. Um, and I'd like to introduce him, but I'm sure he has a better introduction than I do. So go ahead, Ryan, introduce yourself. Well, I mean, my name is Ryan Macbeth. I'm, a, I'm an author, I'm a triathlete, I'm a marathon runner, but I also run a little YouTube channel where I uh, analyze uh, open source intelligence and I also explain different components of how the military works in both short and long form videos. Uh, I also um, work in what's called C4ISR in my civilian job, where, which stands for Command Control Communications Computers Intelligence Surveillance Reconnaissance. So basically my software helps keep soldiers safe by finding bad guys. And once we find those bad guys, then we can give that information to the military and uh, have them make a decision on how they want to handle it. I think that's probably the best description of ISR, C4 ISR yeah. in general. But Command ISR... control and everything in, in general. It's kind of a little bit of a confusing topic, because, uh, but it's, uh, I mean, the whole field in general is extremely difficult. Um, yeah. But I feel like uh, that's kind of the thing that makes the U.S., if you compare any one aircraft the U.S. has versus a Russian one, or one missile system versus another, uh, the Russian one might look better, but it seems like it's really that uh, command and control that can tie everything together. Right. It's not about any one platform. It's right. all of them being interlinked and working together at the same time to really maximize their capability. Right. A lot of it is the integration. It's that we have open channels of communication um, between different sensors and different platforms. And without getting too deep into it, we can kind of glean all sorts of intelligence from different sensors and different platforms and get inside our adversary's decision loop by using that intelligence against them faster than they can make decisions. Right. And that's always been a huge advantage with the United States. You know, it's always been, especially satellite imagery, right, that we've personally have used in the past. And um, when you can get that jump on them, it's like, that, you know, that's what, you know, you look back at World War II, right? Pearl Harbor. Like there was an entire battle group in the ocean the entire time, and we didn't know it for days. I mean, somebody. I mean, there was kind of some like here or there. It was there, but the U.S. didn't really know it was there. And now you got satellite imagery up, and you can see basically everything at all, you know, in real time, all over the world, right? So intelligence has always been super important to the United States. So basically, what you do, it seems to me now that it might be almost more of a problem of having too much information. Not having not enough information, you don't know where something is, but you almost have so much information, you have to sort through what's uh, what's useful and what's not useful and organize it in a way that's going to be productive and not just overwhelm whoever is gathering, whoever is receiving all that. Right. right. That, that's actually a very good point. And that's, that's where filtering and artificial intelligence and machine learning can come in. Um, if you put out a, a BOLO list, like looking for all white trucks, uh, you certainly want to be able to filter out white SUVs, white cars, white uh, vans, and only find white trucks. So uh, we're at a point right now with machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence where we can do things like that. That's technology that is available today. Huh. That's interesting because it could really save you a lot of time just looking for white cars. Oh, yeah, sorting through it. Um I know this is stuff you, you won't be able to get into, and I don't even want to, I'm not going to show too much of it, or any of it, uh, but there's a Russian hacker, you know, they're always popular, right, that had hacked into some 
U.S. and NATO uh, information they're sharing with Ukraine. And it had to drop down a list of every single, pretty much every Russian air defense system, every vehicle where all their artillery are in Ukraine. And they had like the, you know, GPS the coordinates, uh, latitude and longitude, the last time it was saw. And it had like every couple minutes of almost everything in Ukraine. It's just fascinating how much information uh, the U.S. can gather and put all together. Actually, I think I did a video about that particular, about that particular hack. And I said like, oh, this isn't a hack. They just... They just captured some dude's phone. Yeah, I'm sure that's what a lot of it is, right? Because what what they really had was they had uh, they had uh, OPLPs or uh, observation posts. That was the main icon that you saw was observation posts, and that's exactly what some junior lieutenant would need to know, you know, if right. they're doing passage lines. So I'm looking at this and I'm like, your thing wasn't hacked. You you captured some guy. He had his phone. You took his phone. You did the face recognition thing. The phone thing actually that that kind of blows my mind because when you when you look at when you look at all of the disadvantages that can come from having a personal cell phone out in the field with you, and you compare it with the advantages of the intelligence that a cell phone can pull down for you. I think that the disadvantages outweigh the advantages, but Ukraine has seemed to be able to make it work. They've been able to figure out how to how to push intelligence and, down to the individual soldier through cell phones, and they've been able to figure out how to get people to send them intelligence to push that information up through unsecured channels into secure channels. Uh, that way, people can do targeting based on intelligence collection from people who are behind enemy lines. Yeah, it, it did see. Yeah, it, it's funny. He talks about how great of a hacker he is. And then in the very next post he posts, it's saying like, oh, yeah, I have people, uh, you know, send me information if you have anything. So he's not really hacking into it necessarily. Yeah, that, so. that guy uses tools that I write. What did you make then of his other hack or air quotes around hack with uh, Delta? Do you Are you familiar with that one? Uh, I thought that was the one we were talking about when you when you mentioned that. Oh, uh, okay. So the first, yeah, sorry about that. The first one was just actually like a Word document, and it was 50 pages. I think there were two of them. One was 50 pages. The other one was like 100-something pages. But it was just a printout of all this stuff. Um, then Delta, yeah, that's actually an interactive uh, program that Ukraine's using that can map out and, uh, uh, you know, actually in, on a map where all this stuff is, and you can filter through it. That was the other one. He supposedly hacked into that one. Um, claims he was able to go through and change some icons and stuff like that. Yeah, the uh, thing uses two form factor authentication. So most likely what that, I think his name was Joker. What that yes. guy did was what he, he, what he really did was someone grabbed someone else's phone from a prisoner who was captured or killed. And he just had that information on them. That's, Until they finally the deactivated likely, it. Yeah, that's the most likely source of, of the, the hack. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because your family's got to deactivate or somebody's got to like go back and turn it off for you. The you know the company's just going to keep it on, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, it would also be server side too. Cut his finger off, take it with you, <laughs> unlock it, you know, <laughs> throw it in the microwave. <laughs> um, and also, all the information he was releasing was all old. All the stuff came out like within the last month. Everything was from June or July, so it was all dated information. A, a, lot a of list of OPLPs or observation posts, listening posts, isn't that useful? Yeah. Um, you know, Russia, they, 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 they already have all this intelligence. Yeah. You know, they know where the observation post listening posts are. They have soldiers on the front lines that are most likely probing and finding where this, where these OPLPs are. Like that's, that's not that big of a deal. Uh, what would be useful would be things like where high Mars is located or where, uh, various right. artillery battalions are located, but that's not the kind of information that an individual soldier is going to have. And, hmm. yeah, I mean, I guess it, they'd have to come across, you know, like a cell phone or a laptop or, you know, maybe some C4 or ISR equipment that's just kind of hanging out in the field to help them communicate or whatever. Yeah. But, but even if even even if that's still logged in um, and active, it won't be for long. Uh, otherwise, you find an old laptop, it's going to have all the information is going to be dated by then. Right. It's not going to be up to date. Uh, that's going to get shut right down once they figure out that soldier's been captured. Like that's, exactly, yeah. You know, that's useful for X amount of hours, right? 
Are there ways to geofence it too? I mean, if, if they capture a laptop and then they see that it's connecting from an IP address or something in Russia, they can then have it automatically shut off? Now, that's a word I haven't heard in a long time, but you can spoof geofencing easy enough. I mean, you can throw your thing in a Faraday cage, and now where are you, right? So, yeah, the geofencing thing, that'll that'll stop immediate intelligence, you know, but also with, with something like geofencing, you need to know where the front lines are, and that's not necessarily something that's going to get updated minute by minute, right? That's something like that. If you're updating where the front lines are through people's cell phones, that's that's really noisy. And you could use someone's transmitting cell phone as a as a place to, you know, to triangulate their position and drop uh, munitions on them. So it actually kind of blows my mind that people really are using uh, cell phones, civilian cell phones, in a military capacity in Ukraine. Um, I, I think of uh, the NTC, the National Training Center, where you're not allowed to have a cell phone when you're out in the box, um, but uh, and they have they have resources in the NTC which can find people who've had their who have their cell phones and they'll target those individuals. So um, <clears throat> I I can't really envision a scenario where you'd want someone to have a civilian cell phone. But like I said, Ukraine seems to be making it work. Hmm. The other issue I've seen that kind of come up. I know there's a lot of I don't know enough about it to to say one way or the other. And you don't have to either necessarily. But uh, with Starlink, uh, that was one of the things that went on a couple months ago. Um, where they said that Elon uh, Starlink started to not work on the front lines in certain areas. Then I heard a reason being given that it was because of geofencing, because uh, Ukraine at the time was advancing so quickly that they didn't want Russia using Starlink, so they had it fenced where it would work and where it would not work. I would buy that. That's certainly something I would do. Yeah, that would, that would make a lot of sense. I, I Actually, I haven't heard that, but I would definitely buy that as a possibility. They were advancing very fast a couple of months ago. It's actually right, quite yeah. incredible. Now, the Russian Navy has almost been completely on the defensive and has almost pulled back because um, they're starting to deal with um, this new type of drone technology, which really comes, and I say new, it really comes in two different ways, right? It's a brand new design that we've never seen before. Mm. But what's what's really new about it, and what I really find interesting, is that it's crowdsourced. And so what you're seeing in this Ukraine-Russian war is something that we've... I mean, I guess you can kind of say war bonds or crowdsourcing, like, you know, back in World War II. But it's not that was run by the government, right? This wasn't like a private organization or just some random person trying to fundraise money for, like, military weapon technology, right? And so that's what you've started to see. Um, and so, uh, we actually, we already knew about this company too called United 24, but they've since contacted us and, uh, have been trying to, you know, talk to us about different things and how, um, uh, they want to work with us and they're going to give us all this like special media that we can use on videos and stuff like that. It, it, but it's really odd that this is like a weapons maker. That's not like Raytheon, you know, it's just this backwater or literally I, I say backwater, but backyard or garage built weapons, you know, I'm sure it's not necessarily a garage, but, um, but that's kind of what they've come across. And so it's really interesting um, to see these new crowdsourced weapons. I, I, I wanted to pick your brain about what you thought about that. And also real quick, if I can interject too, another question for you is how difficult is this to kind of uh, be able to integrate, like you were talking about before, with the rest of the Ukrainian military? Or is it kind of all just these kind of commando raids happening separately i don't i don't see a lot of integration because in order to have something like integration you need to have project management you need to have plans uh i think what you have is uh, a very uh israeli army type reaction to being invaded where you have multiple people taking initiative on their own to figure out how best to counter the threat um when it comes to the whole crowdsourcing of parts I mean, when you think about it, like, that kind of was done during World War II. A lot of manufacturing in Japan, or at least of light manufactured good, goods, was done by uh, civilians, citizens in Japan, in their homes, manufacturing things for the Japanese army. In fact, that was one rationale for firebombing places like <laughs> Tokyo. And then, well, we're taking yes. out manufacturing. I, I didn't know that either. Yeah. Uh, Read the Bomber Mafia by Malcolm Gladwell. It's an excellent book about how people rationalize 
uh, firebombing entire cities. Um, when it comes to to the crowdsourcing, you know, uh, I, I I don't talk about this a lot, but I made a couple of videos about it. I made a calculator. Really, it's a it's a, a, a protractor, uh, and this protractor uses two uh, five five uh, 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 two uh, five four five cartridges. Uh, to figure out what floor you're on if you're going to shoot an end law from a, uh, a window. And I was able to, within two weeks, come up with a prototype, get people on the internet to uh, create 3D models of this thing, and then give this thing to Ukraine. Um, I, and this thing is actively killing bad guys using end law, you know, helping people plan ambushes using an in-law um yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it was uh the the whole crowdsourcing thing i think the speed of it has advanced i think that um the uh the ability to create 3d printed models and 3d printed parts is an incredible advantage if you notice these Ukrainian drones that are dropping uh, 30 millimeter grenades, uh, they're using fins that are 3D printed or laser cut. Um, and that's something that no military has ever used before. Um, that, that's actually pretty unique. And now since, you know, because of the internet, now you can push this out to the rest of the world. I mean, when I collaborated, I, I don't have a 3D printer and I don't know anything about 3D modeling my model of the Enlaw protractor tool that I created was basically a ruler with a, with a, uh, I can show you guys a picture of it. So it was a ruler with a weight on it, you know? And I just figured, well, if the average Soviet building height is 33.3 meters high, then you can figure out whether this Enlaw will arm in X amount of meters just by doing a simple math equation. So the tool we eventually came up with was a tool that you could use with gloved hands in the dark just by pushing your finger into holes, figuring out how high up you were setting that using cartridges and and uh, going from there. So uh, yeah, that this was this was collaborated through the I got through most of the world. We had people in the U.S., people in Ukraine, people in Poland. Uh, printing parts, and eventually we sent those plans to the Ukrainian Min Mil Ministry of Defense, and uh, they took it from there. Wow! So, uh, you being a command and control guy, or you, you know, you're kind of on that aspect of it. At what point, though, does this start to become a problem with so many kind of asymmetrical weapons, uh, ad hoc things thrown together? Does it start to have an impact, or will that come much later down the road? That's a good question. I, I don't really foresee, I think the biggest issue, I think the biggest issue you'd have is one, you know, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing, right? Right. So you have all of these people coming up with, their, with ideas, and since there's no central coordinating authority, these ideas might be, you might be duplicating effort, right? So that's a disadvantage. The disadvantages are duplicating effort, but the advantage is you're duplicating effort. So if, if one effort fails, true, yeah. you might have someone with a, a slightly different idea and they're going to be able to proceed with that idea. So it's it's inefficient, but but so is war. I know Eric talked to you. He was telling me that you have a, a rough familiarity with uh, drones and, and how they can operate somewhat autonomously. And just, just to kind of like throw, I wanted to throw a little bit of history in here too, because I try to, try to make it a little bit more than just all tech. But um so if you look back um, in the 70s when the Polaris, uh, the Pal oh, I always say the word wrong, Palomaris accident happened where the, the bomber drops those four bombs over Spain oh, in okay, the Mediterranean. Yeah. Um, when that happened, they dropped one in the water and they couldn't find it. Right. So they had to send, um, they sent manned submersibles down there, specifically the, um, uh, it was the Alvin and the... Oh, yeah. there was another one that had this weird name, like the, it was the, the... Deep Jeep is designed as a work and research vehicle. Whatever, I don't remember what it was. Anyways, so they sent, um, they sent this uh, manned drone down there, and as they went down, because they had to have tubes and all, they had to have all this extra special piping and stuff that went down to it because it was manned, it got caught in all of the wiring and stuff and couldn't come back up and got kind of stuck. Um... 
So when uh, when it got stuck, they thought they thought these guys were going to die. They were down there for a really long time, way past where uh, the submersible was supposed to be able to supply them with uh, uh, with an atmosphere and stuff. And so um, when um, when they brought it back up, they were like, "Well, we can't do that again. So let's try out this new technology called Curve, which is a, a corded underwater remote vehicle, C U R V." And when it went down there, it went down there, grabbed the uh, the weapon that they were trying to grab, came right back up. Nothing. Easy peasy. And now mm-hmm. ever since then, they've been using drones for NOAA. And, you know, now you it started to roll into a lot of it was anti-mine warfare in the late 70s and early 80s. Uh, and then you go to the Persian Gulf, right? It was all basically all anti-mining and surveillance and NOAA research. But now you're starting to see it used a lot more, especially in the Ukrainian war, for actual weapons technology. Um, so with the new one we've seen, at least the one we're specifically talking about is uh, United 24. And uh, United 24 uh, has built this, you know, new, it's a new, uh, it's basically a kamikaze weapon. And when you, you, we'll go through the design a little bit and get a little bit more specific. But when you break it down, it's basically just a jet ski with a new casing on it with a bomb in front. Yeah, but with, with Starlink as well. With Starlink. That's the big change. That's the game changer, right? Because that's the thing. You can't control these things outside of line of sight unless you had some sort of aircraft up overhead trying to control it. Obviously, Russia has air defense. They could shoot that down. Um, you could have some sort of inertial navigation thing, but that's only so accurate over such a long distance. Right. Uh, so, yeah, that Starlink thing is really what changes it. Yeah, and so uh, specifically to Starlink, Ryan, I wanted to talk to you about that. Like, what... Uh, you know, with C4ISR, especially with drone technology, you got to be able to communicate with it, right? You don't have somebody there just in case something happens, right? So in terms of over the horizon, especially with like third party, I, I wouldn't say third party, but, you know, uh, and I always call it over the counter, like prescription medication, but like, you know, <laughs> the stuff you could buy uh, off the shelf. There, yeah. there you go. Um, so like off the shelf technology, like how and, and, and kind of bring it back to what we were talking about already, having all this asymmetrical warfare, all this different technology working together. But when you have something like Starlink, how do you think that works? Is it? Do you think it's going to be really reliable, or what do you think about it? Well, it depends on the size of the constellation, right? True. That that that's that's the that's the the question. It depends on the size of the constellation. It depends on whether your adversary can jam the uh, signal that's coming down. In a, in a maritime situation, I think that might be a little more difficult uh, to jam something, uh, mainly because once you turn on that jammer, now you've just presented yourself as a target. <laughs> so, like, if if your if your uh, if your drone has any sense, you can just go, okay, well, track on that jammer. Yeah, now just right? follow the signal. So, yeah, so now you got a choice: turn off the jammer and let them have Starlink, or turn on the jammer and block the Starlink and get get killed anyway, right? So I, I, as long as you have a constellation to pick from, I don't really foresee that being too bad, especially if you're trying to jam and you're you have a satellite that's kind of like right over the horizon. As long as you have enough to uh, to send commands and control information. Um, any kind of ship that's trying to jam your signals might not be successful in that. Yeah, we have a couple of videos too. There were a couple of videos released of the attack on uh, Sevastopol. Um, and it did seem like they were trying to chase a warship. And, you know, it, it was moving from left to right in, in uh, regards to the, the U, what's it called? USV? Yeah. And uh, they kept trying, then trying to turn to the right to catch up with it. It did seem like it was delayed. Because obviously if you want to attack something... You don't go straight where it is. You go straight where it's going to be. And this thing always seemed very, rea- you know, reactive to what had already happened. So it seemed like there was some sort of, de- you know, decent delay that made it very difficult. And I don't think there was really any ever major proof that it was very successful or successful really at all. There are a few explosions, but that could just be those drones because uh, they were shooting at them. Um, that could just be them going off. Right. Yeah. I mean, from I mean, you could tell. I mean, there was obviously a delay because you could tell they had that thing going. And then the the warship kind of just pulled out of the way, but it didn't react like it should have, you know, like a like a Mark forty eight would have, or something that was manned where they could easily switch and turn left or right. This thing was like, oh, the boat's out of the way, then it turns to the right, and all of a sudden they're behind the ship where they should have just ran into it had it turned like it should have. Um, and so with that going into the next thing I wanted to talk about was the camera systems that we saw on it. Um, so there's two two cameras on this there's one on the the bow up front and then there's one in the middle 
that looks like a main camera. And we've been kind of bouncing back and forth on what they both are. Yeah. Um, and they keep changing, too. Uh, there's been three or four iterations of this drone, too, with yeah, different cameras. Multiple setups. variants. We've seen at least four. Um, so it's kind of hard to pick what they are. It could be the same camera. They're just changing the casing. Could be different cameras. Who knows? I would assume they're probably different cameras. But um, the main one that we've seen with the white casing, the one that actually uh, that ran aground in Sevastopol as it was trying to, I guess, tack something, um, it looks like it has an infrared camera on it. Sure. Um, and those infrared cameras are pretty expensive. I mean, they go anywhere from... Yeah, you get one for a real cheap one for maybe a few thousand up to you know fifty, hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, that might so, be the biggest cost in that whole drone. Right, is that thermal camera. And so uh, United Twenty Four says that this drone costs about two hundred and fifty grand to make, supposedly. Um, and if you look at the most expensive um, thermal imagers that you can buy off the shelf, they're about one hundred thirty-five thousand from uh, from the actual FLIR company. Oh. I think it's called the M Four Hundred. Um, is the one I researched. There's a bunch of different variants, obviously, and they go down in price as you want them to, but um, having something that's internally cooled makes it really, really expensive, but makes it really accurate and very detailed. Um, and you can find these little small detailed spots, especially when you're on the water and you're bouncing. Oh, you want it stabilized. Yeah, sure. you want it stabilized and you don't want to have to deal with compression through the video and everything else because then you can't see. So you want to make it as streamlined as possible, but they're more expensive. So anyways, um, so it looks like there's a main uh, thermal camera up top and up front. It's probably just, I would assume, just a regular camera. I don't know. What were your thoughts on it? Uh, <laughs> that's, that's a good question. I think, um, I, I mean, I saw the same footage as you did. I didn't really see, I, I mean, I don't believe I was looking at a thermal camera. Some of the, some of the, uh, so when it comes to camera, you, you ships are big, right? So you don't really need that much resolution. I don't necessarily think you need any kind of thermal camera in order to guide that ship where it has to go. The one thing that kind of surprised me was there was a helicopter that was probably launched from that particular ship that was being attacked that was trying to hit that drone. And they just could not hit that darn drone. <laughs> they couldn't yeah. hit it. And I, I that kind of... You know, you, you can't put yourself you know, into that person's shoes um, because you don't know what they were going through, you know, and they're trying to hit that thing. But Yeah, they're being screamed at. They're being yelled at. Yeah. You're going to kill everybody. Not only that, come. but shooting from a helicopter is weird because you don't lead a target. You actually shoot behind it because the bullets have that extra velocity. As I can't figure out why they were oblique to the threat as opposed to parallel to the threat. Because if they had pulled up parallel to the threat, they would have been able to rake that thing from you know stem to stern, right? Yeah. But for some reason, they were oblique to the threat, and the rounds were just going everywhere. I couldn't, like, I don't know why they chose to do that. That's um, that must be a training thing, and that that's been, I mean, that's been a big issue with Russia just in general like people just don't seem to have any kind of training that has a reflection in reality you know, on, on how you'd actually deal with a threat yeah that was the whole thing with china right they don't have training so they're not as scary even though they have the assets because they don't have the the pedigree and the 200 years is with civil war you know whatever right you know so it I, I, and it is important right because i mean you can you can tear apart a lot of different militaries throughout the years and how they lost because their training sucked right i mean look at us in the beginning of world war ii we sucked at the beginning of world war ii because we were running around with this old technology nobody was trained nobody really cared right nobody even wanted to really be there anyways and so it, it can really make a big difference yeah i've seen a lot of those reports too this uh, very very similar stories about yeah their officers will take pictures set them up the, the line you know chain of command be like, yep, we're doing the training. The training is being done. Um, and I guess that's hard to prove that it's actually not being done. But that seems like a much better comparison, if anything, that I've learned at least from this whole war, uh, Ukraine versus Russia, is how much training can really sh give you a better idea of how well they're going to perform than, uh, you know, they have the latest tank. Or they have a 2,000 of these. Ukraine only has 500. From what I understand, just a couple of years ago... Uh about two years ago china had their first ever brigade level airborne operation and when i was invited down to fort bragg uh in order to cover how paratroopers work and how riggers work the 82nd airborne dropped 700 some soldiers 
that day. And they're constantly dropping soldiers. So when you take a look at the kind of training that something like the 82nd Airborne goes through compared to what China considers a significant event, you really can see the training differences between the United States and China. Yeah, it was interesting, too. I was talking to a... I wonder how quickly that'll change, though. Because uh, we, when we had on... Oh, man, I'm, I already forgot his name. The, the guy from the Flutter Pilot podcast, Vincent Aiello. Vincent Aiello. Yeah, yeah. so he was a, com- he was a commander, uh, instructor at Top Gun, um, a whole bunch of stuff. But he was a fighter pilot. And uh, he talked about what his opinions of... Or, you know, pretty much what the U.S. Navy thought of China at the time. And his expression was pretty much, oh, look, how cute. Uh, that was like 2005. That's completely changed. So, you know, it'd be interesting to see where China then goes, you know, another five, ten years from now. That might all change. Right. But, yeah, I really think it's fascinating that it, it's probably much better to look at, like you mentioned, experience and then also training. Because a lot of people, including me, you know, you look at a lot of the equipment. What do they have? You know, they have all these aircraft. Ukraine doesn't have any or, or hardly any. They have all these tanks. Ukraine has, you know, much older ones. Um and a lot of people use that as a benchmark to kind of judge, you know, what's going to happen. Right. And it's, you know, that's not the case. Actually, I am of the opinion that the T-72 is not a bad tank. I I will die on that hill. Uh, it was a good tank for the time period for what it was supposed to do. It was designed to be smaller so that it wouldn't be hit by main gun rounds. It was It was a good tank for that time period of what it was supposed to do. Only issue is that nowadays people aren't trained well on it, and a missile doesn't care how big you are. <laughs> you know, it's just it's just gonna go right to the center of those track gates. So right. that uh, that 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 is an issue today, right? That that didn't exist back in the seventies and eighties when the T seventy two was deployed initially. That's where I think it gets interesting too, because uh, you know it's a, it's a decent tank, it's a good tank, and all depends on what variant you talk about too. They have. You know, brand new variants made in 2016 um, that are more up to date. But also a lot of it came down to the T-72. A lot of Russian stuff is made to be built to last, that anyone can really use it. It's really easy to maintain. You know, it just has a diesel engine compared to the M1 Abrams. Pretty much has a jet engine in it, and it requires a ton of maintenance to keep that thing up to date. And that all kind of wraps back around to what you do for a living, the C4 ISR. Uh, being able to integrate all these things together... Um, you know, a T-74 might be, a T-72 might be great for having mobilized people use and be able to train them really quickly and low levels of maintenance. And uh, whereas an M1 Abrams, I mean, giving those to Ukraine would become a, a lot more complicated because really where the strength, I think, of the Abrams comes in is, uh, again, being integrated into everything else, but also having all the support, all the maintenance, all the supply lines set up to keep those things operational. And uh, that's not necessarily something that we know Ukraine has in place to be able to do and really make full use of that. So if you're a C4 ISR guy, and then also at the same time, you're doing, you know, kind of for fun, makeshift programs. You were talking about a compass and a, and a, or a ruler and a weight and, and trying to make these kind of more asymmetrical things. How do you tie those two together in your head? Um, does it ever kind of bother you? Does it get with you? Do you feel like you're, uh, you know, have two different ways of looking at stuff? That's an interesting question. Um, I don't think it has. I think I think what what bothers me more is knowing that I that my tools, um, my tools have, have killed other people. You know, my my tools are actively killing bad guys. Both the um, both the 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 tool that I developed, you know, the the 3D printed tool. And uh, and the software that I wrote, you know, it, it's actively uh, stopping bad guys from doing bad things, right? That bothers me a, a little bit, you know, um, because you know I, I I've done the whole war thing, didn't like it, um, but I know it's one of those things that has to be done. The, the end result, of course, is stopping bad guys, and a lot of people who've been in combat kind of knows what that means. Um, but I, I feel pretty comfortable that on uh, on the day of judgment, I'm going to be able to stand in front of God and explain every single line of code that I wrote that stopped bad guys, and every single 3D printed tool that stopped bad guys as well. I, I would like to think that that what comes out of my head is a force for good and a force for freedom. 
Interesting. Yeah, that, that's interesting because for at least for me, I, I never served. I was never in war. Never deal, dealt with any of that. So it's a lot more theoretical for me. So that's kind of the way I look at it. There's not a lot of real world implications for what I do and the way I think about stuff. Uh, so yeah, that adds a whole other element to it, which is a yeah. I was never in war either. I just smoked cigarettes in a Humvee and once in a while. I just drove down the road to see who blew me up. <laughs> but uh, but still, just kind of knowing. Drive down this road. We want to see what happens. <laughs> but yeah, just knowing what is going on behind the scenes, like the implications of uh, you know what you're doing, what you're talking about, and again, the projects you were talking about working on. Uh, I get yeah, it's a whole other element that I've just never really thought of or doesn't necessarily apply or hit me at home. Right. So that's fascinating. I think that's a good way to end it. Yeah. Um, we've still got a whole lot more to talk about, but we could go on for hours and hours and hours with all the stuff we come up with. So um, thanks again, Ryan, for uh, for being on our show. I really appreciate it. You gave us a very good C4 ISR. Uh, like, uh, there's a whole lot more to it than I thought. Yeah. Um, Everyone else I've ever seen explain it always makes it, it seems like they make it so much more complicated than it needs to be. Uh, I guess maybe it's just one of those topics that's difficult to really narrow down and explain it. You know, it like it's really fine, just find the bad guys and determine what you want to do with them. Mm -hmm. Yep, basically, right? But, well, I mean, I'm sure we'll have them on again. Thank you so much. I love your channel. I love watching Cobra Cabal. You guys uh, are a fantastic intelligence team, and I'm so happy to be a part of your show. All right. Well, awesome, man. Thank you. Thank you so much for spending the time. And uh, we had a few technical issues, but thank you for bearing through uh, that with us. And uh, I guess we'll see you next time.